In a field lies hope, anticipation, from the biggest races to the brightest stages, taking you on the wildest ride. Forbidden trade, forbidden trade, with a gigantic upset. Tall Dark Stranger answers the bell. For the glory, the pride, the payoff. Enter the field, the Ontario Sire Stakes Program, from Ontario Farms to the world stage. By now, you know the name COSA TV, an industry leader producing unique, high quality digital content promoting harness racing in Ontario. Features, virtual programming, live events and more, COSA TV has it covered. Follow our social media channels and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page to view the latest content. COSA TV, taking Ontario racing global. Hello everyone, I'm Heather Vitale. Welcome to Harness Racing Updates Twos in Training, sponsored by the Central Ontario Standard Bread Association and the Ontario Sire Stakes. The word great is described as considerably above normal or average. So to describe tonight's guest as a great trainer, well, personally, I think that's an understatement. Okay, so how would I describe him? Well, we're gonna let his world champions and his awards speak for themselves. You'll see what I mean as we chat with Bob McIntosh in this edition of Two's In Training. Again, welcome everyone to Harness Racing Updates Twos in Training, sponsored by COSA and the Ontario Sire Stakes. I just want to remind everyone that tonight's Twos in Training is pre-recorded, so if you're going to do questions on Facebook and YouTube, we can't answer them live. However, we do love, 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 love your comments. So yes, if you're going to comment, we want to see them. And you know, COVID has been, you know, in a word, UG, all I can say, but I can tell you that, you know, technology is wonderful because I'm here in the United States. Bob McIntosh is in Canada and I still get to do an interview with him. So thank you, Bob, so much for being on Twos and Training. Well, thank you, Heather. I've always admired you for a long time. <laughs> You oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, this whole COVID deal, I know like it's taken a strain on everybody, but things are looking up. So how are you feeling? Do you feel like the glass is half full now instead of half empty? No, I, I've always been an optimist. So I think it's half full. I think we can see the, the end in sight. So uh, hopefully get everybody vaccinated and get back to normal. That's uh, my no. Feeling. Yeah, well, I'm, I feel the same way. Yes, yes. Things are definitely getting back to normal. And I'm, I'm so, mm -hmm. so grateful for that. Hopefully one day I'll be able to go to Canada again. Well, you're welcome here anytime. <laughs> you can come to say my farm. No, I would love to. I've never been there. It's like crazy. No, We've known know, each other for everything. so long. Yes, 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 we, I have we go back. yes, yeah, I know, uh, I'm definitely, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, definitely hold you up to that. And we're, we're going to do a visit there because I'll be taking lots That'd of selfies great. with a lot of different horses. That's super. Uh, so you, you know that I was interviewed by Hoofbeats. Uh, I right. don't know, it was a, and, and they'd asked me if I could switch one day, like just trade places for one day with one person in harness racing, I was like, yeah. duh, it's Bob McIntosh, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, <That's weird. laughs> who would you switch places with if you could switch places with someone in harness racing for one day? No, oh, probably John Campbell back when he was driving. <laughs> 
Uh, and like, yeah, I think everybody thinks like when you're talking about a driver, like all time, the first person to come to mind would be John Campbell. Yeah, and we've been, John and I kind of grew up together in the same area. Like I know him, I've known him since he's been about 12 years old. So we go way back. Oh my gosh, I didn't know all that. <laughs> yeah, he grew up around the way. I used to, my dad used to race around the London Western Fair racetrack. And that's where John kind of cut his teeth too. I was always jealous of him because his dad let him warm up when he was only about 12 or 13 years old. And I didn't get to do that. So it was always a little sore point with me. <laughs> well, we are going to talk about your history. But first, we're going to talk about some Macintosh mastery here. Talk about some of your awards and some of the um, accolades that are on your resume. So, of course, you've been the Canadian Trainer of the Year seven times. You've been the Canadian Breeder of the Year four times the United States Trainer of the Year, two times Canadian Horse Racing Hall of Fame. You're also in the United States Harness Racing Hall of Fame. So when you hear those, like, what do you think? I'm pretty humbled because I come, my dad only had like nine or 10 horses and we used to jog up down the back roads. So I've come a long ways from weekly on that little farm. Like I never expected my wildest dreams to. I always knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be around horses and race horses, but I never my wildest dreams to thought I'd get this far. I'm a real surprise. Well, uh, well uh, you know, I'm glad that you mentioned your dad, Jack, because I want to yeah. talk about your history a little bit. So your dad, Jack, and actually your brother, Doug, uh, both respected horsemen in themselves, great horsemen. and you know, like, tell me about growing up in the barn. So when you were growing up, you always knew you wanted to do this. You know what, way back when, when I was just a little kid, my dad always had a few brood mares and uh, I was just in love with those little foals when they were born. And I'd go out there after supper at night and take a little brown sugar and a little wax paper and, and let them uh, take the sugar off my uh, my fingers. So. I was pretty well horse crazy from the time I was born. <laughs> I was obsessed with horses always. And my dad was a great teacher. He loved animals. He was good with any kind of livestock. He was really, really knew how to make them look good and how to feed them and how to treat them. And then uh, later on when I graduated high school, I went to work with my brother, Doug, and uh, I'll, I owe him a lot because he taught me the grand circuit way, you might say, and there's no, the right way. And uh, at a young age, he gave me a lot of responsibility, which really helped me out in the long run. It really, I was only a kid and I was training horses over in Hazel Park and Wolverine. So got to give him a lot of thanks. Oh, definitely. I love Doug. He is, he is, he is so great. Yeah, he's a good guy. So you got to tell the story about, and I find it so interesting when your father passed away there's a deal with you and doug and your sister and about getting horses so can you tell that story sure i mean it was uh 1983 when my dad passed he had three yearlings at the time so my brother doug my sister mary Ann and i just drew them out of a hat and i thought i got the worst deal of it because this big billy J.W. Barbara, she'd be pacing through the field and she'd fall right down. So I thought I got the short end of the stick. But, uh, you know, as it turned out, she was a, that was my uh, gateway horse for us. She turned yeah, out to be a ended, really tough there. Yeah, she ended up and, winning 13 consecutive races. Is that right? Yeah, it kind of put me on the map. So in Windsor, when I just had a bunch of claimers, so. I started out with nothing, with one 5,000 claimer in 1977 or 78. So, uh, yeah, she was my first horse I really had in the uh, top classes. Okay, so she, we're going to go from Jade. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> Just so everybody knows, there's a bit of a delay going on. So, so if I cut off Bob, 
it's uh, <laughs> only because we're getting a delay. So I apologize for that, Bob. Um, I was just okay. going to say, um, yeah, going from JW Barbara uh, to this list that I'm going to, I'm going to rattle off a list of names and then we're going to go to my three favorites. All right. So, I, you know, going forward from there. So we've got, oh my gosh, we've got Art Escape. We've got Western Shooter, Thinking Out Loud, Delinquent Account, Island Fantasy, Immortality, Ponder, So Fresh, <laughs> When You Wish Upon a Star. I mean, like, I could do a 60 hour broadcast, honestly, on the <laughs> different horses that you've had, but um, <laughs> we've got things to do. <laughs> uh, so Jimmy. I, and I just can't do everything as far as talk about all the amazing horses that you've had, but I can tell you that there are three that I really want to talk about so badly with you. We're going to start out with Cam Luck. All right. So let's take a look at Cam Luck. First of all, as a sire, you know, his foals have earned over 226 million. It makes him the second leading money winning Santa Red sire of all time, ranking him only behind Better's Delight. 69 starts, 26 wins, 11 seconds, five thirds, over a million in earnings. And he had that time trial in 148 and four. So Cam Luck, obviously one of your standouts but one of the things that I find interesting is actually he did not even race as a two-year-old, did he? No, he didn't. He couldn't really do get of his own way as a two-year-old, and uh, he just wasn't mature. And uh, it was a long process, but uh, yeah, I paid 70000 for him, which is a lot of money for me. So I was quite concerned, but as a two-year-old, then he come back as a three-year-old, and uh, he just progressed from there, and he got better as the age, as he, better as he got older. So there's kind of a funny story here. It's like Bob McIntosh story time tonight. <laughs> like, tell me a story, <laughs> Bob. Okay. Uh, so tell me the story about you actually had him sold as a stallion, and it didn't go through. Yeah. Is that right? That is true, because uh, no, uh, yeah, Bobby Hill actually had him. I priced him at three hundred thousand after his time trial because their sons of Cam Luck really didn't have done anything by that time with sires. And on his way to bring the check, he got arrested so, for uh, trafficking marijuana, I guess. And so that deal fell through, and it's better to be this proves me you better be lucky than smart. <laughs> Because he turned to be a super sire. So, yeah, that's, a, that's a true story. A super sire and a super broodmare sire. Very true. Great broodmare sire. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Really, okay. Really I mean, just, I mean, unbelievable. Like, to be sec, and he has been passed away for several years. To, like, I mean, he's still second on the list. I mean, it's truly unbelievable. It's, it's point something else with Heather that uh, several years ago, the uh, USTA decided to to uh, punish us on a Canadian dollar opposed to the American dollar, or else he'd be a lot farther up the list, which I don't agree with what they did, because a dollar is a dollar. A dollar that's is a dollar, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no problem. Well, we could definitely do an interview about that at another time. Yeah, yeah I could discuss that for a while. <laughs> well, we're going to move on to another one of your greats, one of my favorites. Of course, that is Art's Place. So we've got the 1992 Horse of the Year in the U.S. and Canada. 49 starts, 37 wins, 7 seconds, 1 third, over 3 million in earnings. <laughs> 149 and two was his mark. And what we're gonna do is, right now we're gonna check out the stretch of the 1992 Breeders' Crown.
Cam Luck, the third marker in 124 and 4. That was a 27 and 3 backstretch for Arts Place. And Arts Place is an eighth of a mile away from 15 in a row this year and a second Breeders' Crown. Arts Place is looking truly invincible. Another amazing sight. He's pouring it on under wraps. Arts Place wins the Breeders' Crown in 152. Uh, Bruce Odd stage for second. Cam Luck was third. Fifteen. Okay, so that's his 15th in a row, but of course we know he went 16 for 16 that year. Yeah. So when you see that, like, how are you feeling to relive that memory? Well, that's just a, it was a dream year, that's for sure. I had uh, a lot of good aged horses. And, like, it was just a real honor to get him to train. I mean, George Siegel and Brian Monson called me in the winter of his four-year-old year, before January, and asked if I'd like to train him, and that was a no-brainer. <laughs> so, sure, I'll take, train him. And then he come back just fantastic. I mean, he had some sickness issues, sickness issues as a three-year-old, and a little bit of lameness problems behind, and, uh, you know, it was just a dream year. I can't say enough about Brian Monson. He never missed a race. So of his four-year-old year and him and doris his wife were there every every race and uh, brian was a true friend of mine and he just died way too young like he was a great guy and a great great friend of mine do you have a favorite arts place memory mm, well i uh, yeah one of them's one of them is the Raiders crown uh win because john said that night he could around went around one more time just the same speed. And another one's at Sportsman's Park when George and Brian were both there when he went to the American National. And that was a special night, pretty pretty big night. I was first, second, third that night in the American National. It was a, well, a great second, year. Third? Yeah, it was uh, I believe it was uh Arts Place, Odds Against and Cam Luck. If memory serves okay. me right. The All dream right. team. <laughs> I love that. The dream team. You know what? I don't even have this. I have like all these like Bob McIntosh clipboards lying on my couch right here to like pick up so that I don't want to forget anything. But just this is a out of the blue question or impromptu question. So, you know, Kat Manzi took the mark on Arts Place. So what, yes. why wasn't John there that day? John had a drive in, I think it was the North American Cup up at Toronto. And uh, so I asked Kat to drive him. And there wasn't a lot of people. It was a quiet night at the Meadowlands, actually. Like everybody was up in Toronto. But Kat drove him and he drove him great. And I said, uh, when you make your move, make it strong. Because, uh, and he, that was a cool night, too. That wasn't, a, that wasn't a warm night. It wasn't speed conducive, but he just jogged that night. And Kat did a great job. It's a great memory for Kat and myself. Uh, definitely, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if you're going to pick a driver to sub for John Campbell, it might as well be Kat Manzi, right? Yeah, he won, he's won a lot of races with a great driver. Absolutely. Okay, now moving on to... Last but not least, you know, is Staying Together. So also known as Stanley, the 1993 Horse of the Year, United States and Canada, 95 starts, 46 wins, nine seconds, thir I'm sorry, 16 thirds, almost 1.7 million with a 148 and two career victory. Now we're gonna look at the Driscoll from 1993. By half a length, three quarters and one twenty-one, fastest three quarters ever. Three sixteenths to go, and they're on their way home. Staying together, and O'Donnell leads it a length and a half too. Cam Best is second on the outside. Silver Almhurst, length and a half to Survivor Gold in deep stretch. It's staying together, and nobody's gonna catch them. Staying together by two. Let's look at the time. 148 and two. Fastest race ever. 148 and two. <laughs> that was before 
148-2 was a thing. Like, that was way before 148-2 was a thing. Oh, my gosh. So when you look at the teletimer, are you thinking, like, okay, I'm going to freak out right now, or am I expecting that? <laughs> like, I mean, like, what's going through your mind? Well, actually, I was up in Toronto racing. I think it was at Woodbine or Wood Greenwood, one of the two. And uh, I got the phone call, and uh, it was just, I did good there, and I did good in the Meadowlands. It was unbelievable. It was just jaw dropping, but uh, that horse was some kind of horse. I mean, he just never got tired. He could carry his speed forever. And, uh, you know, that, that year we had a lot of good time with him. He had a great year. And Bill John. Bill O'Donnell drove most of the time, and we had a lot of fun traveling through the country because, as you know, Bill was fun to be with. <laughs> we had a lot of great times. Oh, I, absolutely, absolutely. And I want to mention that staying together not only held the world record on a mile, he also held the world record on a half mile, okay? And it's no secret that he is one of my all-time favorite horses, my, my yeah, all-time favorite, that. Bob McIntosh. Yes, you know that. You know that. I know. Um, so <laughs> he went to the horse park in 1995. Uh, he just passed yeah. away in 2019. Every year I would go and give him treats and back scratches. I love, love, love this horse so much. Uh, I, I mean, he was just an incredible horse. What was it really like to train him? It, I see him at the horse park, you know, when I would go there, and he was just so lovable was he the same in the barn yeah stanley was very laid back i mean he was just a professional racehorse he was kind of the old style the standard bread like he wasn't a pretty head or anything but he was old style standard bread with uh, modern style speed that's what I, that's what I that's what i would say about him but he was he was just a dream to train i mean he was great i always loved that horse even as a thrill when i didn't have him i said that's the best thrill there's out there I always, always yeah. believed him. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I, I don't. I go ahead. I'm sorry. What? No, you go. You go. You're, the you're the call. guest. <laughs> <laughs> when I got the call to train with Bob Hamster, it was like, yes, for sure. I love that horse. So I, the rest was history. Yeah. No. It so good. Part. So good. Again, anybody that's coming into this interview. And it seems like I am talking over Bob. It's only because I'm getting a delay. <laughs> That's my, <laughs> just so everyone knows that, including my bosses, okay? So I just, I wanna show you this because I don't know if you knew that I had this. So I have a staying together halter. Ah, um, very cool. So cool, I, right? So cool. Yeah, so it's, like, it's, um, uh, I'm glad you this got that. Of, uh, me too. Me too. Um, this is one of my prized possessions. Uh, it's in my office. I have it actually hanging up in my office. And um, I got it from the horse park. So I always, before this interview, I said, I'm not going to cry. <laughs> but this horse <laughs> was unbelievable. And I got to visit him every year. And it was such a pleasure. So great to be a part of his life. So. Um, I always felt like he knew me when I would go to the horse park. So, uh, I would, oh, and by the way, if there's any scientists watching this, I'm always thinking because I never cleaned this halter. So I was like, I'm going to get the DNA off the halter and make another thing together. <laughs> hey, that's a good idea. So, <laughs> I thought you. so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first on Jews in Training. <laughs> so you had um, you had Cam Luck and you had Arts Place and staying together all at the same time. I mean, like, do you just pinch yourself and think what is happening? Well, staying together come a year later after Arts Place. But yeah, that was my lucky streak for sure. I mean, it was just a dream come true. All those big races, and they're just great horses. I mean, they're just great horses. Just proud that I got, uh, proud and happy I got a chance to train them. So we we know that my favorite is staying together. Uh, 
who's your favorite? And it doesn't it doesn't have to be staying together. You won't hurt my feelings, but who's your favorite out of everybody that you've ever trained? Oh boy, that's a tough question, Heather. Uh, I couldn't really nail it down to one horse. Uh, I mean, they've all been great, but uh, I think the horse that the best horse I ever trained was Western Shooter, ever. And uh, unfortunately, we lost him as a two coming three year old. But that horse had, I think he was the fastest horse I ever drew a line over. He was just unbelievable. Just tragic that we lost him. He was something very special. He could place 26 second quarters looking at the birds in the field. Like he just was ultra talented. And it would have been, it would have been a great sire too, but uh, it was a tough deal to get over. It took me a long time. Oh, yeah, no, no, I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, we're going to go to um, a breakdown of numbers now. And uh, I knew I should have had an assistant with me to give me tissues while I was talking about staying together, by the way. <laughs> so much. So, but um, yeah. all right. <laughs> uh, the, we're going to do like how many race horses do you have right now? So we're going to do like how many race horses do you have? And then how many two year olds do you have? Well, I, it's about 50-50 racehorses and, uh, and two-year-olds. I think it's, I train around 45 or 43, something like that right now. But like half of them are probably two-year-olds. So uh, we're pretty well, you don't train many horses older than uh, three. I think I got a couple. But uh, basically, I concentrate on two and three-year-olds in the stake races. Okay, so then you also have, you've got yearlings, you've got babies being born, and then so you own parts of basically everything. Is that right? Yes, basically. Okay, uh, okay. I got a lot of home birds, so worked out well in the home birds. Yeah. Uh, so you own parts of almost everything because the oh. risk, the risk is higher, but so are the rewards. Is that what we're going with? That's about the truth of it. As my dad always told me when uh, I was growing up, and it's not always true. It's not the whole truth, but he says you got to own part of one to make real money. And uh, here I am with owning probably too many, <laughs> but it's worked out well for me. I'm very happy. So, yeah. Owning too many horses is like being too thin or being too rich. Whatever. You can't own too many. <laughs> well, I'll tell you next fall how it works out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So how many stallions do you own and then how many broodmares? Uh, stallions right now, I only own one. And that's thinking out loud. And I think I have around 21 broodmares. That's count. And, uh, you know, I raise them my way. I got, I did really good buying off Stoner Creek years ago when I was getting started. So I kind of modeled my way of raising them after Stoner Creek's way. And, you know, they never, never in a box stall once they're, once they're weaned and, uh, and, and uh, go outside, they're never in a box stall. They're raised outside like real horses. And, you know, when we bring them in, we just herd them on the trailer cattle put them in the stalls and uh, you know they're they're raised rugged they're raised to last uh, it's, it's worked out well my programs worked out well well of course we so we know why you own parts of them you know we talked about the risk the reward but you mm -hmm. used to go to a lot of yearling sales but now you have been become a breeder well like we mentioned earlier four-time Canadian breeder of the year so then yeah. why is that? I've... Well, years ago, we were spending all that money at the yearling sales. I, you know, I got a pretty good foundation brood mares and uh, started breeding them and it's worked out really well. In Ontario here, the breeders rewards are very attractive. Like it's, it's really a good system for a breeder. So I've taken advantage of that. And uh, I always found with the yearling sale, yeah, you could do some good, but they had to be raised. I think you can have the best breeding in the world. If you don't raise them right, they're not going to be any good. So I raise them my way, and uh, so far it's worked out pretty well. 
All right. Well, we're going to get into our two-year-olds now. Um, but, you know, I'm thinking it's March, just the beginning of March. So just as an overall view before we talk about the names, how are they coming along? They seem like a decent group. I mean, uh, I don't know. John Campbell used to call me every spring, and I was a two-year-old, and before he said anything else, he said, how many do you hate? <laughs> And so I can say right now that they're a pretty good group. I don't dislike many of them. <laughs> but, you know, I can, who, who knows right now? Yeah, anybody that tells you they know that great horse now is lying because uh, you never know until you get behind the gate. The first time they get tired, you know how good they are. Um, what about race ready? Then, like, when do they have to be ready to go behind the gate? Usually I baby race the third week in June. I'm not in a big hurry. And uh, foundation miles are like very, very important. Like my two year calls now have been at 230 about half a dozen times. And uh, it's all about foundation. I mean, and you know, they got, you got to have a good cult with talent, but there's no shortcuts to uh, conditioning. It, if you don't put enough miles in them, conditioning in them, they're going to fade away in this fall. And uh, they'll be good in the spring, but they'll be summer, but they'll be gone in the fall. So. It's all about putting those foundation miles in. Uh, no I shortcuts. Love that. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's huge advice right there, you know, for anybody listening. I mean, that's that's key. I think, like you said, foundation miles, like just like going slow with them and putting the miles in because what's the big hurry? There's no shortcuts and every jog miles conditioning, you know, and you got to jog lots of miles, put a lot of miles in them. There's just no sh shortcuts. So, uh, you know, if they're no good, they're no good. But I'm going to make sure they got a lot of good foundation in them. That's great. So now let's take a look at the two-year-olds. We actually have eight that we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to start with one that you actually bought from a sale because we've got eight total, seven of them homebreds. The first one we're going to talk about is Devereaux. Sealster, and um, right. and yes, so Devereaux Sealster is a trotter. So we've got three trotters. First of all, we've got Devereaux, who's a colt trotter. He's a Trixton at a Darjeeling. This is her first foal. She was an online purchase from the London Select Yearling Sale for twenty-two thousand American. Uh, tell me about Devereaux. Yeah, my brother Doug actually spotted that colt. Because he, uh, he trained the second damn strong team. He was a very good trotting filly. So he pointed her out to me. I looked at him. He was a nice colt. Uh, so we ended up buying him. And uh, I own a third. My brother owns a third. Doug owns a third. And then uh, my, my other another partner of mine from uh, Michigan, Randy Leepka, owns another, uh, the final third. And um, he seems like a good horse. But, you know, I'm he's... Good enough that I'm going to waste some steak money on him anyway. But uh, I'm very high on him. So, but you know what? You never know until you get there. But I love him so, right now. Oh, well, that's good. No, that's good. That's good. Um, with him, so if he's an online purchase, then how mm -hmm. do you inspect him? Did you guys actually go to the farm or just look at the videos online? Uh, Doug actually went to the farm, and then uh, later my cousin Al and myself went up to look at some other ones, and we we inspected them quite a few up there. So, no, I'd be not comfortable just buying them off videos. I, I want to go to the farm. Fair enough. So now the rest of them, you get to go to the farm all the time to look at because they're probably at your farm, right? So we've got the home mm -hmm. brand. Well, You've got seven of them. Yeah, they're <laughs> not far away. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've got a couple more trotters to look at uh the next one is jack it's a colt trotter a muscle mass out of crafty now this is this dam's second fold but it is her first colt so tell me about jack yeah. i like him a lot but he's got a lot of natural ability his mother crafty has a lot of talent but just blame this it and the first one out of her, uh, the muscle mass, really hope so, didn't raise a two-year-old, but we just started her. And I think she's going to be a pretty decent filly, too. But he, he shows a lot of great gait. 
at this time, you know, I'm happy with them. All right. Okay. Time will now tell. we have what? I'm sorry. What? It said time will tell. <laughs> time will tell. That's right. That's right. We've got one more trotter to talk about. We're going to talk about make it easy, and that's a filly. So she's another muscle mass, and she's out of I'm so ready. Now I noticed that this dam has three foals. They're all fillies. So a lot of people are like, I want a colt, I want a colt, but she's giving you all fillies. But you're okay with that, right? Because you have a good, you know, you've had a good record with fillies. Yeah, the four-legged kind for sure. <laughs> but no, she, <laughs> no, she's a really nice filly. Got a lot of, a lot of good feet and a lot of, a lot of talent, I think. But again, time will tell. That's right, that's right. I know it's only the beginning of March, so we're just getting into things. So we just want to make sure like, yeah. if our viewers are, you know, they see like make it easy out there on the field, they're yeah. like, Bob and Heather talked about her. You remember her from Shoes and Trading. <laughs> right. That's right. Um, we're going to go to the Pacers now. I, I've got a Colt Pacer for the first one we'll talk about. It's Better Style. This is a Better's Delight out of Strike and Attitude. And I mean, like, Strike and Attitude, right? I mean, she was all that on the track. Million dollar winner, world champion, took a mark of 148 and 4. Now, this is actually Strike and Attitude's fifth foal, and she's actually already had a couple of good ones. Yeah, she's been a good friend, man. I mean, the first foal was a thinking about he never picked as a baby and chipped his shoulder, so he never even trained. And, uh, you know, she's had a, another uh, Sun Beach somewhere, Philly, that was good last year. Um, kind of stumble on her, you know, but... Uh, this is a very nice colt. He, he's a happy colt. He's got a good attitude, which you really want with a, with the uh, better delights colts is a big question their attitude, and he's got a go forward attitude. So he shows very good at this time. He's a happy horse. Okay. He's a happy horse. Yes, he is. Uh, so we're gonna check out latest attraction. Who's a colt pacer? And this is a Sunshine Beach out of Drop Dead Gorgeous. This is her second foal. And actually, it's her first foal out of Sunshine Beach. So let's talk about latest attraction. Yeah, he's been a very impressive foal. He's kind of like a little sports car. You can really go zero to 60 fast. And uh, he shows, uh, I'm pretty, I'm very pleased with him. The, the Drop Dead Gorgeous was a little handful of a, the train like she was not a not a nice to train but in her first one was affiliate of her which is well like her but this is her first call and uh, and I think he's gonna be fine. Alright so we're gonna end with three thinking out loud and the first one is actually a Philly pacer. So we're gonna check her out. It's let me be me and the mom is no shame in my game. So I know that <laughs> this mare has not been getting in full like every year, but actually she's had babies that like all of them have taken marks. So she's been a great breed. Yeah, I mean, yeah, she's been a beast, pretty good brood mare and this filly is a long leggy filly and uh, really covers the ground easy. I'm, uh, I'm quite high in her. I think thinking aloud hasn't had much success yet, moderate success, but the ones I'm training this year, I think I'll put them back on the map because they, they really are impressive. Okay, so the next one we want to, want to talk about is Matters Most, who is a Colt Pacer out of Thinking Out Loud and Breath Defying. The dam made almost a quarter of a million dollars. And actually, um, this is her ninth foal. She's had seven ponders and then a shadow play. And then this one is a Thinking Out Loud. Yeah, he's a very nice colt. I mean, uh, he looks like a good colt. He looks like a good horse for his track. And uh, seems to have lots of talent. That mare's been a pretty good brood mare. She was tougher and well bone herself. And uh, she's been a decent brood mare. But this colt seems a little special, I think. And uh, hoping for good things of him. Let's take him up to the good. 
but he's very creative and uh, great mannered and uh, so far so good. He's unbeaten. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're all unbeaten so far that's right that's right now then who figures out the matches for your horses oh actually uh my cousin al comes up and we go through them together we've been doing this for years so he's uh 50 percent re responsible for the the good ones and and the bad ones too <laughs> but we work together we've been uh partners since 1978 i think so uh we have a close relationship and we've never had a bad word over all those years and he does help me out with the matches and uh together we figure it out right or wrong all right well now um we're also going to look at night out and this is another cult pacer uh thinking out loud is the sire and the dam is eve of the ball uh this is her 11th of fall. Yeah, she's getting up there in years, but she's had the last few years she hasn't anything much, but uh, she's been pretty good in the past. And this call, when he come in, he just looked like a, he's a good looking call. I mean, he's built right. He uh, moves great. And uh, I think he's got some talent. But uh, right now, you know, I like him a lot. He's got a great gait. He's got a great attitude. So that's all I can ask for right now. He does his work you know, easy. Are, does his work easy. No, that's that's good. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, so we do want to mention that the pictures that we saw, actually, you had taken. And I wanted to also say that you love photography. So I didn't want to get out of this interview without actually showcasing a few of my favorite pictures that I stole from Facebook <laughs> um, that I love so much. And I wanted to show your talent uh, as a photographer. So how did you get into photography and why do you love it so much? Well, I started way back when uh, I was still in grade school and my, uh, my parents bought me a, bought me a, uh, a little kit where you could uh, develop your own film and a little cheap camera and i just got the bug right there i used to have a dark room up in my up in the upstairs of our old farmhouse and it just grew from there through high school i did quite a bit of work for the yearbook and uh just some things catch my eye i don't do it as much as i used to but i'd like to get back in it a little bit more it really is a it's an outlet from the stress of training horses that is totally different. So I really did enjoy it and hope to do more of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's cool. That the most photography I do are like selfies with my iPhone. So I, I really appreciate <laughs> seeing your pictures. You. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we, we, we do have some of your questions um, that I'm going to pose to you because I have pretty much interrogated you for, you know, long enough. So we have a couple other people <laughs> that want to ask you questions. So um, we just want to say again, thank you to COSA and Ontario Sire Stakes for sponsoring today's twos and training uh, as we go into our viewer questions. So we have Charles Foster's asks, and this is a two-parter, by the way. All right. Of all the yearlings you've purchased, which one was the best bargain? And do you have a favorite sire? Best bargain was the married Shell Escape. And uh, she was a uh, large escape, by the way. And uh, I bought her for 25000 and she ended up making, uh, I don't know what she ended up making, but uh, she did very well for us. I think she ended up making around 500000 600000 And uh, I'd say that was my best bargain. And as far as favorite sires, I got to go back a ways. I think Abercrombie's were always good to me. I loved Abercrombie's. And uh, I'd say he was one of my all-time favorite sires of the old right. days, but nowadays, no, I'm a little behind now. <laughs> but uh, I like No, the, Abercrombie, I mean, still like a legend. So no, I'm digging it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, they were good horses. They were tough. They were good. Yes. Yes. The easiest right, to train next... at times. Oh, right. Go ahead. No, it's all right. No, no, no. You go. You go again. The delay I, I, is, um, you know, putting a little hamper on, you know, us having a true yeah. conversation. But yeah, yeah. You were saying. Abercrombies weren't the easiest horses to train. Uh, they would like to get out of the work a lot, but uh, but you know when you got them there, they were tough, tough horses. They wore well. They're very sound. So. All great reasons for having that be your favorite sire. No, I yeah. love that. I love that very much. So we're gonna we're gonna go to our next question. It's from Adam Jones. So he asks. Uh, have you ever considered buying horses from the UK and Ireland? I can't, I can honestly say I haven't, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I see the sport over there is growing and that, that's encouraging, but, uh, no, I can't really, I got enough horses here. I don't need to be buying them from Ireland or UK, <laughs> but it's, it's, it would be interesting, but not for me. Well, I can tell you, though, it's definitely worth a visit because, like, as you say, the sport's growing over there. And I've been over there about six times and it is so much fun and they definitely love the sport. So at least put it on the list there to at least go over and make a visit. Oh, I'd love to because uh, all my heritage is from the British Isles. So, uh, yeah, I'd love to get over there sometimes and check it out. Maybe in the future. Uh, yes, definitely, definitely. No maybes, just definitely. Yeah, well, I'm gonna go there. <laughs> That's for sure. It's on my bucket list. <laughs> all right, all right, good to know. Now, now we're gonna go on to our last question from our viewers, which is Shelly McMillan. She asks, "You have an incredibly strong broodmare band, but in recent years, you have also had some very strong race mares." So what criteria do you use to decide to add these mares to your broodmare band or not? Great question. Yeah, it is a good question. And, uh, yeah, I, when I can, I, I usually do to get the kid race mares and turn on the group. Sometimes it depends on who my partners are, but uh, yeah, I hate to let a good mare get away, good race mare. It's, I'd rather add them to my broodmare band, but sometimes people don't want to have broodmares and partners, so you have to you have to disperse them. But that's that's only occasionally. I got a good bunch of owners, great partners. Yeah, yeah, obviously, and for many years too. So you've been really blessed with that. Yeah, right now I've got the best. Uh, the best of the best for quality partners. They're just really great friends and really great people. That's awesome. So you're basically living your best life. I guess you could say that. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm healthy and well and still enjoying what I do. So what more could I ask for? Absolutely. Except for a visit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm telling you, as soon as this blows over, I'm so there. I'm so there. Yeah, yeah. I'm ready for COVID to be like out the door, late at the end of the tunnel. Okay, Heather. Sounds good. <laughs> now, before I let you go, though, you have to hang out with me for a couple more seconds just while I plug our harness racing updates, twos and training. I've got two next week we're going to two a week so um i've got julie miller on monday she's awesome right i mean like all that in a bag of chips <laughs> <laughs> yes and then i have got nifty norman on wednesday so we're doing two a week uh and then i just want to you know tell everybody go to harnessracingupdate.com because obviously Bob and I both subscribe to HRU, so that's what all the cool people are doing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a great I, I, newsletter, I, I, so we want you to subscribe. And um, yeah, man, oh, this is, oh, 
Thank you. I mean, like, just thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here with me. I'm so grateful for this. And I've loved our discussion today. I had a great time too, Heather. It was great to see you. Thank and you. Hopefully thank we you so can over we can we can get together. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. No, hopefully we definitely will. So I will see you soon. And uh thanks, Bob. Yeah. And thank you everybody out there for watching. I so appreciate it. And we'll see you soon. Reach the people you have to reach by advertising in Harness Racing Update, the sport's most comprehensive and timely news source. HRU provides the best bang for your advertising dollars because we reach and engage your potential customers anywhere in the world. Not only has HRU grown its subscriber base by nearly 30% in just three years, but our open and click rates far exceed industry averages, which tells us that readers are engaged with the digital publication and how they receive it. Plus, your ad support helps us keep HRU free to subscribers. Find out more today by visiting HarnessRacingUpdate.com and clicking on the advertising link at the top of the page.